There's something about Ruby that has been bugging me for a while and I just couldn't concentrate on my current work as it's been distracting me all the time. Have you noticed that the supernatural seems to be only revolving around Ruby? Now Ruby's past self, Sarina, died when she was 12 years old, but she did not reincarnate straight away. No, no, she reincarnated 4 years later, exactly when Goro died, which was exactly when I gave birth. Now, why is that? We know from chapter 1 that Sarina was a massive fan of Ai, there's no doubt about that. It's also been shown several times throughout the series in Ruby's flashbacks of her life as Sarina. But what about Goro? Was he a huge fan of Ai before he met Sarina? This is the important part. Chapter 1 starts with Goro going crazy over Ai, clearly obsessed with her. But this happens 4 years after Sarina died, because Ai is 16, not 12 as she was when Sarina was alive. One of the nurses points out Goro's creepy devotion to Ai, to which he responds by saying he's got his own reasons, then proceeds to talk about Sarina and how she has changed his life. If we look at his flashback with Sarina, we can see that while she is super hyped about Ai, Goro isn't. It seems like he had no interest in Ai at the time. He even tells Sarina that if she becomes an idol, he will support her and become her fan. Back to the present day, he tells his nurse that perhaps he's seeing Sarina in Ai. If she was still alive, they would be the same age. Now if you think about it, Ai was basically living Sarina's dream. And Goro said that he wants to watch over the one who walks the path Sarina wanted to walk. Heavily implying that she's the reason he's devoted to Ai. That he became a fan of Ai to become a fan of Sarina. Therefore, Goro wasn't a fan of Ai before he met Sarina, he's only become one because of Sarina. Now look how nicely this ties into the whole reincarnation thing. In the same flashback from chapter 1, we can see that Sarina is the first to mention the reincarnation. How she would like to be reincarnated with a cute face like eyes, be born a celebrity and have the looks and connections from the start so she can be an idol. That's her dream. Goro, on the other hand, doesn't believe in reincarnation and has no dreams that would require it. Only Sarina does. And so, four years after she died, she reincarnates as the child of the person she obsessed over, who happens to be a celebrity and an idol, alongside the only other person she loved and admired, Goro. She's got the looks, the connections and the two people she genuinely admires. She gets to literally live her dream, Sarina gets everything she wanted. What does Goro get out of this? Nothing, absolutely nothing. I mean sure, he gets to live as the child of the person he became a fan of, but his reincarnation serves no purpose to himself or to Ai. He helps Ai every now and then, but as soon as she dies, all he does is focus on revenge. Acting isn't his dream, it's a means to achieve his revenge. So you see how this whole reincarnation seems like it's meant to fulfill Sarina's dream? Furthermore, the only other time when the supernatural makes an appearance is during the Takachiho trip, when Ruby and Aqua return to Miyazaki. But before we talk about the supernatural in Takachiho, I want to point out further confirmation that Goro became a fan of Ai for Sarina, which we see in chapter 75. The keychain of Ai she gave him that he would always cherish, and Sarina's confession that cemented his devotion for good. Now, Supernatural, and of course I'm talking about the Crow Girl and how she only showed herself to Ruby. Uh, breaking news! The pesty Crow Girl just showed herself to Aqua in the latest chapter. Why do these things happen exactly when I'm recording? Now, this changes a few things, but nothing too major. Based on Aqua's conversation with the Crow, it seems like he has either met or seen her before. Maybe he also met her in Takachiho off screen. Or perhaps he's been having sort of regular conversations with her. Because this is 100% not their first meeting. Aqua doesn't question anything she says, he doesn't deny her existence. He seems aware that she's not a kid but a supernatural being. He also knows that she spoke to Ruby. Possibly because she told him about that but he knows either way. Now this reveal doesn't change that much about Aqua. It's interesting that he knows about the crow but it doesn't seem like she has any influence over him. His goal remains the same with or without the crow. Unless somehow she made Aqua believe Kamiki was the murderer back in chapter 10. 
If that's the case, then it would mean the crow girl is using the twins to hunt down Kamiki for the reason that's not I, which doesn't really make much sense. An interesting thing that stood out from their conversation was when she told Aqua to think about the meaning of his soul in that body, suggesting that it's not about his revenge mission but something else. If it was about the revenge, then the crow wouldn't mention that because she would know about it. And if revenge was what she wanted, then she would let Aqua get his revenge without taunting him for no reason. But that's not what she wants. This brings me back to Ruby and why I think it's possible the crow wants Aqua to fulfill Ruby's dream or to support her while she achieves it. It's interesting that while it seems like Aqua has met this crow thingy multiple times, maybe in different places, we know for sure that Ruby has only met her in Takachiho. First, when she used crows to guide Ruby towards Goro's corpse in chapter 77, where we also learn that Ruby still has feelings for Goro, which again, might further support that Goro was reincarnated as Aqua for Sarina, and second, in chapter 79 when the crow girl literally showed herself to Ruby to guide her towards the truth which would put her on a path of revenge. She could have also been in chapter 72, here in this panel right before Kamiki showed up, maybe as a way to warn Ruby about his presence. Uh, fun fact, in chapter 12 Ruby gets scouted by an underground idol group and she says that it feels like she's being guided, right guided towards her dream. I don't know if it's meant to mean anything but it's a nice coincidence. The essential point here is that the crow girl was important to Ruby while she seems to be an afterthought for Aqua. Her introduction was made through Ruby, she had a massive impact on Ruby and she seems happy with the path Ruby has taken. So it seems the supernatural only revolves around Ruby. Of course Aqua is also involved but it doesn't seem like he's all that important and given that we established the reincarnation happened for Ruby, it should mean that the whole story is also for Ruby. Now. What's interesting about Aqua is that he had always been looking out for Ruby throughout the entire series, from watching her first steps into becoming an idol in chapter 7 to making sure she can live her life freely without his support in chapter 106. He's always been there to not only make sure Ruby achieves her dream, but also lives her dream, fulfilling Ruby's proactive dream while taking care of his reactive revenge. Chapter 118 also implies that Ruby and I's troubled childhood shared some similarities when it came to their mothers. Now of course, Ruby's real mother has actually showed up at the end of the chapter and she's involved with the film, we'll have to see how this plot point develops, but what I want to look at is Ruby practicing for her role. She reads some of the lines and gets stuck at Mom won't come, that's the line that triggers something in Ruby. Film-wise, it could be that Ai's mother abandoned her, hence why she didn't come. Which is interesting when you think about how, when Ruby, Sarina, was dying, her mother didn't come to see her, nor did she come before that. Sarina's mother abandoned her the same way Ai's mother abandoned Ai. That's the connection. I'm thinking that now that Ruby is reading the script and her mother showed up, it will trigger some bad emotions and memories in Ruby and we might get to see a flashback of both Ai and Ruby's lives with their mothers. That's going to be quite interesting. Now, Takashiko wise, in chapter 74 when Anemone mentions the famous deity of arts but can't remember her name, Aqua is quick to point out the name and when asked if he knows about it, he internally says that he knows it very well. And the first thing that came to my mind is that this is proof Aqua has met the crow before. Even though he's from Takachiho and he would know about Ame no Uzume, he wouldn't specify and emphasize that he knows it very well, unless there's something more than meets the eye. And so obviously he met her before and that's why he knows it very well, right? Now, one interesting thing that happened in the anime adaptation, which I'm not going to use as canon, but I just want to point it out, is that at the end of the first episode, which would be the end of chapter 10, right when Aqua figured out who might be Ice Killer, this old crow-like ink formed into his eye. Crow... crow girl, right? This would mean that Aqua has met the crow at this point or before this point, like as soon as he got reincarnated. Now whether this is true or not doesn't matter that much as long as we know that Aqua has met the crow multiple times, which we know based on how he reacted in chapter 118 and how he called her a pest, meaning she kept showing up to him multiple times. 
Now, Ameno Uzume is known, among other things, as the goddess of arts, and we know that Sarina wanted to become an idol. So, it's possible that she prayed to this goddess to help her become an idol. But would that mean the crow girl is Uzume? Not necessarily. In my first video in this series, I concluded that the crow girl is likely Atagarasu, but if she's Atagarasu, then she can't be Uzume, right? Well, Ameno Uzume has a connection to Amaterasu the goddess for who Yatagarasu works, so to say. Uzume lured Amaterasu out of the cave she was hiding in and thus brought back the sun to the world. It's a long story, better check the legend or this section in my video. But anyway, the point is that there is a connection between Uzume and Amaterasu, and it's not far-fetched to say that Amaterasu sent Yatagarasu to aid Uzume. Or maybe Uzume has access to Yatagarasu. Who knows how the relationships between these deities work? The point is that the connection is there, it's just up to Akka to handle the details. And so, what I want to propose is that Ruby, in her life as Sarina, prayed to Ameno Uzume to help her become an idol, and because her life ended abruptly, the goddess offered her a second chance to achieve her dream as Ruby, Hoshino. With Aqua acting as a guardian, protecting and making sure Ruby achieves her dream, as a way to erase his regret of being powerless when Sarina was on her deathbed. Something along these lines, at the very least. Before I end this video, I want to take the opportunity to answer a couple of questions that kept popping up in my comment section regarding I and the supernatural. The first is whether I planned her death, and the second whether I is the Kroger. And the answer for both is no. No. Think of what would anyone get of I planning her death? She wanted to watch her kids grow, give them opportunities, do all sorts of activities, have a parent-child concert with Ruby as idols. She wanted to hear people saying, isn't Ruby's mom too young? Do you see what I mean? Nobody benefits from I planning her death, not her kids, not herself. With the information we currently have, it doesn't make any sense. It also doesn't make sense for I to be the crow girl because she wouldn't push her daughter towards revenge. She wanted Ruby to have a good life, not one consumed by revenge. I also doesn't know about the middle schooler and the stalker coming to the hospital because she was giving birth at that time, so she wouldn't have that information to share with Ruby as a crow girl. You know, the whole idea of I reincarnated is kind of odd because it undermines the prequel of the series, you know, the first 10 chapters, which is why I don't think it's possible. With that being said, thank you for watching, this was just a short video that I needed to get out of my mind. The next one will be about suspicious people, where I'll break down some characters that are particularly suspicious and see what that means for the story. But it's going to be long and needs a lot of work, so don't expect it too soon. It will come, eventually.